So Monish, thank you so much for being here. As always, we're ecstatic to have you and I can't wait to jump right in. Okay, great to be here. I don't recall what year this is for us, Arvind. Do you know how many years it's been? I think it's 13 or 14 in that range. All right, time is flying and good to see you and good to be with your class. And the good news is that since uh, you don't have any repeaters, I can use the same jokes. I don't have to keep coming up with, with new jokes. All right, so I'm, I'm actually always excited every year to speak to Arvind's class because it's such a hardworking, dedicated group. And I think you guys have some, you guys have a treat in life, having him as an instructor and all the amazing speakers he brings in. And uh, somehow he still finds room for me, which I'm surprised about every year, but I'll take what I can get. So anyway, <clears throat> what I'll do this time is I'm going to go through some slides, which you can see is the Uber Cannibal framework. And, and we'll get through these. Maybe, I don't know, I haven't timed this before. It's a new presentation maybe 30 to 45 minutes, something like that. And, and then we can, we can get into Q and A, what you have in mind and what Arvind has in mind. And it can be related to what I've presented, or it can be whatever else you want to talk about. And I'll uh, get from there With that I'll get going. And uh, so I think Charlie may be speaking to you soon, which is awesome. And he has this quote, play, pay close attention to the cannibals, the businesses that are eating themselves by buying back their stock. And basically what we're going to do in this presentation is what Charlie says in one sentence, we're going to have about like 45 slides to explain what he means by that one sentence and then take it from there. So I'm going to go through some, some different companies and what they've been doing in terms of buying back their shares and what that's led to. And there's, there are a range of different businesses and some of these you might be familiar with and others you may not, but that's okay. The one that's the poster child or the two that are actually poster children of these cannibals, which are in our time in the sense that they still continue to gobble up as much stock as they can. The first one is NVR, which is a mid-Atlantic home builder. And NVR made, made some changes. They went through bankruptcy or near bankruptcy experience in the early 90s. And the CEO at the time, he did a bunch of soul searching and he basically changed their complete business model in how they operate. And in fact, now the home building industry, most of the other major players have shifted to his business model. What he started doing is two or three things. Number one, no dividends. Number two, no stock splits. And number three, the place where ho most home builders put their cash and capital is in purchasing land. He also went to a capitalite model where instead of having large land banks, he basically went to a model where they only had land for the next year or two of, of homes to be built. And beyond that, they had options on purchasing land from, from landowners. And what you notice over the last 28 years is the share price, which was $5.50 in 94, is now approximately $4,000. And in fact, one thing to keep in mind about all these stock prices is that in general, we are not at peak valuations right now. We've seen significant declines in equity. So in fact, if you look at NVR, they were close to 6,000 at the end of last year. So the stock went from $5.50 to about, to about 4,000. It's not a dot-com and it's not a tech business. It's a home builder and it doesn't have a fancy PE. It's trading at less than 10 times earnings. So it's not like it's on some euphoric PE or anything. So if you look at the NVR as a business in 93, they had almost 18 million shares outstanding. They have 3.3 million shares now. They've bought back 82% of their shares in the last 28 and a half years. No dividends, like I said, no stock splits. And the stock's gone from $5.50 to more than 4,000. It's a 727 bagger. Now, earnings went up 150x, which is massive. Uh, we're going to look at a bunch of other companies soon, and you will notice that none of them took their earnings up anything near that rate. And this is a 27% annualized rate of return over almost 30 years. And so it's, it's quite remarkable what they were able to do. There is a formula I came up with, and actually I came up with this formula as I was pulling, pulling these slides together. 
So the best way to learn is to teach, which is why I love doing this class with Arvind because it forces me to learn. So the way to calculate, I think the way to calculate the cannibal return formula is to look at the growth in earnings and multiply it with the, so you take 100 as a numerator and then 18 as the denominator in this case, which is the percentage of shares left. So it's about 5.5, which is the multiple pop you get because of share reduction and then the multiple expansion. And again, like I said, because right now no one is buying any homes with 7% mortgage rates and all of that, their multiple is pretty low. And this predicts a like a 783X and it's pretty close to that. It's 700 odd X in both cases. The second one, which is the poster child is AutoZone. And again, the interesting thing to remember about NVR and AutoZone is that these are very basic businesses these are not businesses that you would think of as being high flyers or a high return equity or any of them, even though they've become that way. NVR is a very high return equity business because basically they took away anything that takes up a lot of equity. So if we look at, if we look at AutoZone, they had over 150 million shares outstanding about 24 years ago. And, and now they have a billion shares outstanding because they Shares outstanding have gone down a lot. It trades at the teens, mid to high teens, multiple. And again, if you look at the story here, 87% of the shares have been bought back in 24 years. No dividends. They, did, they didn't get the memo about not doing stock splits. And uh, so they've continued to do the stock split. But if you adjust their stock, it's basically gone from 27 to 2160. It's an 80, ba 80 bagger. Over this 24 year period, earnings went up 11X and it's a 20% annualized rate return. So again, if you look at our formula, uh, you get about an 85X and 84X, so it's pretty close. Then we get to the other one, which is AutoNation. Both AutoZone and AutoNation are ones that Eddie Lampert had a significant position and actually had influence on the board. And basically, I think that's one of the reasons they went down this path. Of, of buying back their shares. AutoNation is basically a car dealer with dealerships all over the country. They've got all kinds of brands that they have dealerships for. Again, 450 million odd shares outstanding. And now it's about 56 million. And actually in their case, it's a little bit distorted because their multiple is really low right now. They're trading at four times earnings. So maybe this might be a something interesting to look at. But anyways, it's 88% 80, of shares gone in the last 24 years, no dividends. And uh, the stock is a eight bagger. So the earnings have gone up just three times. So it's a three X in earnings over this 24 year period, so about a nine and a half percent rate of return. But one thing to just adjust is that if their PE is of three or four times the current PE, then you wouldn't have an eight bagger. You would really have a 20 odd bagger and those return analyzed returns would change. So I haven't looked at AutoZone in a lot of detail and I haven't looked at specifically why it's at such a low multiple because generally speaking, the auto manufacturing business is not a great business, but the, the dealerships are a tremendous business. And especially if in, in their case, so they've got a lot of Porsche and Mercedes and BMWs and so on type dealerships. Basically the back of the house, which is doing all the parts and service, that's a license to print money. It's very high, high return. And the front of the house does really well on the, the used cars and the financing. The place they, where they don't do well is the new cars because people can compare them shop and all of that, but they, they tend to make it on the, on the financing and other aspects. So Overall, car dealerships are a very good business. Then we look at H&R Block, and this one actually was a little surprising to me to look at. So 24 years, they had 400 odd million shares outstanding, which is now about 160 million trades 10 times and historically is traded a little higher. And again, in their case, they bought back 63% of shares. They haven't been as rigorous on their buybacks and as consistent, and they've had dividends and all that. Stocks only gone up 3x. And earnings have only gone up 1.4. So I would have expected this business to actually have done better because it's actually a very stable franchise business where the tax code keeps getting more complicated and 
most of us either need TurboTax or some preparer. And HR Block is a low cost producer amongst tax preparers. But anyway, it's a 8% annualized return with reinvested dividends. Then we look at Jack in the Box. They used to have 72 million shares outstanding. And Jack in the Box basically has been over the years slimming down. They've been converting their company owned, sh- owned stores into franchise stores and, and, and getting a little more capital light over the years. But again, this is one I would have expected would have done better than it's actually done. But anyway, the shares outstanding have gone from 70 odd million to 20 million. So they've bought back 71% of their shares in 16 years. Earnings have been flat, which is surprising. And just a 6.3% annualized return over that period. And recently they bought, they bought Del Taco, which is interesting. It's it's like Taco Bell. And so we'll see what they'll, what they'll do with that. Usually these businesses, if you can run it the way Burger King is running, which is mostly franchised or or the way Dairy Queen runs, then they're really good businesses. Then we have Apple, which has basically gotten buyback religion in the last 10 years. And, and if we look at Apple, they used to have 26 billion shares outstanding and it's about 16 billion now. And they just reported earnings and they actually had a good, anyway, about 40% of shares been bought back in the last 10 years. And again, split adjusted, it's a six bagger in the last 10 years, the earnings have gone up two and a half X. So Apple's delivered about a 21 and a half percent annual rate of return with the reinvested dividends. And, and we know that Warren has the stock and I think Warren is very happy with them doing these buybacks and increasing his ownership every every quarter or Berkshire's ownership. Then we have IBM, which also Berkshire used to own. And IBM in the last 28 years, they had about 2.3 billion shares out. And now it's about 900 million. And you can see that they basically stopped their buybacks in 2018. And in fact, the share count has been going up after 2018. And so if you look at the entire period, it looks like a six bagger and earnings went up three X, but IBM is actually a business that you actually have to parse a little more carefully. If you look at the business from 2001 to 2022, which is 21 years, it's zero returns. Uh, And the reason it's zero returns is it's actually a business in decline. And Buffett bought the stock in 2011 and he sold the stock in 2017. And for him, it was actually loss. It was negative returns over that period. And so one of the things that's really important about cannibals, we might be in the next slide. We'll actually get to that in in a second. And when you look at Sears, we have a number of stocks here where Eddie Lampert has his fingerprints, AutoZone, AutoNation, and Sears. The buybacks have worked for AutoZone and AutoNation. They have not worked for Sears. And the reason they didn't work for Sears, he was buying back shares from 2006 to 2011 and took out about a third of the shares over that period. And basically, eventually Sears declared bankruptcy. And and if you look at this this particular one, the returns are zero. Basically, they end up being multiplied by zero as a zero. So when we do buybacks, one thing to keep in mind that's really important is that we need to have a business. It's okay for the business to be cyclical. For example, NVR is a cyclical business. The business ebbs and flows. But we cannot have a business that goes into secular decline. And the nature of capitalism is that almost everything is going to go into a secular decline after a few decades or less. And so one needs to really have a viewpoint on what the business looks like 10 years from now or 20 years from now. And I remember, I remember recently I, I was talking to Charlie and he was musing about Apple and he said, they don't really have much in terms of book value. And he was saying, look, if we own a, like a car dealership and the business kind of goes sideways or goes down, we've got the real estate and we've got a few hard assets and we can salvage something from all of that. A business like Apple is trading on a multiple 
of future earnings. It's not trading on one time book value or something. And Apple is an interesting business because at least when I look at it, I don't see anything affecting their franchise for 10 years, but I can't make that statement for 20 years. So what does Apple look like in 2042? And I don't know, it could be a much stronger company than it is today, or it could be a much weaker company than it is today. And I think 10 years from now, I would say that the odds are pretty high that Apple is still cranking, best I can tell. So anyway, I also want to parse and we are a little bit more than we did in the first go around. And this slide has a little bit more granular data on the amount of shares that are added to compensate manage, management versus the shares bought back. So if you look at the, towards the bottom, there's a, there's a row which says, shares added through incentive plan. And you can see in 94, it was 2%, 2%, then 96, it's 11%. And there's been a consistent amount of shares that's been added. Now, they bought back so much that the net effect is still a reduction in share count. And we looked at the net reduction in share count. But the thing is that if you, if you look at it, it's consistently through this entire period, approximately 5% of the business has been given away to the knights who manage the castle. So the CEO and the senior team is in effect extracting approximately 5% of the equity value every year as their, as their compensation for running the ship. And of course, we have to pay the knights who run the castle, but how much we pay them does matter. And so if we look at NVR, over the entire period, entire 28 year period, they bought back approximately 6% a year. But if you look at this period from 94 to 2005, during that period, they bought back nine, more than 9% a year. And if you look at the returns over that period, 94 to 2005, the NVR stock went up 128X over that 11 year period, which is 55% annualized. And if we look at the period after that, which is 2006 to 2012, they only bought back less than 2% a year. And then again, 2013 to 2022 was about 4% and 17 to 22 is about 2%. This is much lower than the 6% overall or the 9% over, the, over that period. And so if we look at their annualized returns from 2006 onwards, it's a 6x, 12.5%, not too bad. And then in the last five years, it's about 3% annualized. Now, that's not a long enough period. Their stock has also gone down about a third over that period. But we can also see that their buyback rate has gone down a lot. So when we look at that formula we had, which is the multiple, the growth in earnings with the amount of shares that are reduced and then and the than the any kind of multiple expansion you get. A 2% annualized share count reduction is unlikely to get you to the promised land. And we'll see a little bit more about this in a second. And now if we compare it to Apple, for example, in this case, the knight or the knights who are running the castle are on average taking about 1% of the business every year. So the incentives, the shares added to the incentive plan is approximately 1%. Now, of course, the difference in those two companies is a massive amount of size difference. So Apple has 400 billion or something in revenue and 2 trillion or something in market cap. And if they take away 20 billion a year and give it to their worker bees and their, their senior management and so on, it's more palatable just because the size is so big. So 1% is okay. It doesn't affect things that much. 5% is there, NVR has delivered over the years. Now, the other thing that's happened with Apple over the years is their multiple has gone up. And so they bought back an average of 5% a year. And really from 2013 to 19, it was 5.5%, close to 6% a year. More recently, because the multiple has gone up, it's about 3.5%. And so it's unlikely that Apple 
unless they were to lever up, is going to be able to buy back more than 2 to 4% a year. So the buyback rate is an interesting one to look at just because it, it tells you something. So why did buybacks not work for IBM and CEO? We cannot have businesses. Just It's just common sense. I own 10% of a business. I keep buying back the shares. Over time, I own 20% of the business. That's all fine if the value of the business has gone up over that period. The earnings have gone up. Everything's gone up. And then I get the kicker of more shares owned or more bigger fraction of the business owned. But if the business is in decline, it's actually going to hurt you a lot because you never got the dividends you never got to put it somewhere else. So what can be a really great boost can end up being a terrible outcome because the business went into decline. So it's really important that when we look at these cannabis, you have to look pretty deep into the future. So let's say if you look at a business like AutoZone, in the absence of electric cars, if we continued with internal combustion engine cars, AutoZone is a great business. Basically, their demographic that uses AutoZone really leverages AutoZone a lot after the cars are out of warranty or extended warranty, kind of cars that are more than seven, eight, 10 years, 12 years old type of type of cars. And they really are, a, because they've got so much expertise in the store and ability to quick, quickly stock, stock up or replenish the stores and so on, and they've got such high margins on on, on their stuff, it works. Now, trick cars are very small today, but they're going to become a larger and larger portion. So California has a mandate that after 2035, you cannot sell internal combustion, combustion engine new cars. So the used cars are still there, but if, if by 2035 or 2040 or 2045, all cars sold, are correct, then they would start feeling that, they'll already start feeling it even now because there's a small decline taking place every year, which is going to become a large decline. And of course, their demographic and the cars they're servicing. So what I'm saying is that I, I don't, I couldn't make a statement. I don't think AutoZone is going to go into a decline in 10 years. And they may not even go into a decline in 20 years, just because of the gap, the lag from the time these cars, but 30 years, becomes questionable. Nation, because of franchise laws in the US and all of that being so tight, I think the business will be around. But again, the back of the house, what is being spent on service today with combustion engine cars versus what will get spent on service with battery powered cars is quite different. So not quite sure whether the back of the house is going to be as good a business as it is today. It may be because the cars are more complex or so only the people can deal with and so on. But so what I'm saying is that when we look at these businesses, it requires us to really go deep into the future and look at them to really, because if they're going to do these furious buybacks, then you need to look at that. So some things about the framework, and then we'll dive in a little bit deeper, is that again, we've talked about stable or growing earnings. One needs to have a view from 2022 to 2042. Cyclicality is okay, and we are a cyclical, but they typically don't lose much during downturns because they don't really build spec homes. Every home they build is already sold, and they just have a few models that people walk through and so on. And the only thing they lose when their sales go down is that their overhead. What it costs to run the business is they may not be able to scrim much. But if you look at this period from 2007 to 2009, which was pretty much the most extreme stress test you can put any home builder through. NVR was profitable through that period. Their profits dropped a lot, but they didn't lose money because of these characteristics. And uh, so there's an interplay between the earnings growth, global expansion, and the amount of shares bought back. And if a business is growing its earnings 15% a year, which means the earnings are doubling every five years, you know, 72, and 84% uh, of the shares are taken out over a 20 year period, that's a hundred bagger. So you didn't need to have a really high rate of 15% is a healthy rate of growth. Apple's growing about 10% a year or something. If earnings grow 10% a year, 80% of the shares are taken out, will expand by 50%, it'll be a 50 bagger in 20 years. So you can get some spectacular returns, even with 10, 15% consistent growers. So 
in the end, what matters after 20 years is what percent of the shares are gone? What are the typical earnings and growth? Is the business still stable and growing? What multiple is the market awarding the business? And the important thing in all these cannibal oriented businesses is they shouldn't hold back from investing or reinvesting in their business if they've got great opportunities. So AutoZone is still opening new stores. It's just that they're taking some of the excess capital and, and using that for buybacks. The interesting thing to keep in mind about cannibals is we had two very fine investing minds make large mistakes with cannibals. We had Buffett with IBM and we had Eddie Lampert with Sears. Sears is a mistake, but Eddie has been a great investor beyond that. He did really well with AutoZone and a bunch of other things. And I think the Sears and Kmart buys were really good. It was just him trying to run those businesses for a long time which was where the mistake lay. He had just bought, he actually got his money back pretty quickly by getting rid of some assets and some stores. And then I think he needed to just package and sell the whole thing and move on, which is where the mistake lies. If we look at some businesses, which I think look like great cannibal candidates, so ADP, for example, I think it happen because your disruption comes from all over the place, but I can't see their business really going into decline in 20 years. It hasn't gone into decline in 60 years. Tool works just because it's like a mini Berkshire, Berkshire Hathaway. Microsoft, I think, looks very solid for a very long time. Alphabet, Amazon, Tencent, maybe not Tencent after what's happening in China, but at least Tencent two weeks ago or something. But it still might be okay. But anyway, so these are really good cannibal can candidates. They need to prioritize internal growth at high ROE or buybacks only buy back when they don't have other stuff going on. If we end up with a gifted capital allocator, which is really hard to end up with, who knows when to throttle the buyback, when to increase and when to decrease, then you really get magical returns. That's really hard to get because most management teams aren't really good at understanding when to do them. But we had one manager besides Buffett, and that was Henry Singleton who ran and Henry Singleton. So Charlie knew Henry and Henry could play chess blindfolded with eight people at the same time and beat them all. And uh, he, he was just a amazing manager, amazing business person, great capital allocator. So he formed, he founded Teledyne in 1960. And we, when he was 40 odd years old and from 65 to 70, he acquired 130 companies issuing stock to acquire these companies. And typically he was buying these companies for like, like around 10 times earnings. And he was issuing Teledyne stock to the sellers. And the Teledyne stock was trading between 40 and 70 times earnings. So basically it was, you could think of it as a roll-up, but it wasn't really. So he was very heavily in aerospace. Then he branched out into a few other places, but he, he did a bunch of things, which is very similar to the way Constellation software runs, or maybe even some similarity to the, similarities to the way Berkshire runs. So when he bought a company, even if he owned very similar related businesses, he left those companies alone and he left inefficiency in terms of they didn't try to consolidate the back office, put all the HR on the one company, put all the payroll and accounting under headquarters or any of that. He kept the business unit independent with the inefficiencies of running everything as a separate business. And the reason he did that, the same reason that Constellation does it, is he wanted to hold the managers accountable. So the managers had incentives. So typically, they were the owners that had sold on the business, or maybe someone the owner had nominated to run the business. And so they played very close attention to how these businesses were performing. And because they never integrated them with their acquisitions, they could easily do apples to apples comparisons and that and take care of that. Then in 70 and 72, when the bear market set in and Teledyne stock nosedived, its PE fell below 10 and he could no longer use stock to buy things. And what he did is from 72 to 84, in 12 years, 
Henry bought back more than 90% of Teledyne's shares outstanding. And his earnings in this 12-year period tripled. So he was at approximately $1.64 a share in earnings. And by 1985, he was $45 a share in earnings. The stock went up 40x over this period. And in fact, what Teledyne did is most of the buybacks were not done in the open market. He issued tender offers to buy back shares. And the first tender offer you issued in 74, he offered to buy a million shares, I think for $20 a share and 9 million shares got offered. So he was really shocked at the number that was offered and he took the entire 9 million. And then later he did six or seven of these tender offers and he didn't have the cash because the amount he was buying back outstripped the earnings. So what he did is he did exchanges. And so he told the shareholders that they could give Teledyne the stock they had. And in exchange, they got 10% debentures. And amazingly, all these people were really excited about taking the 10% debentures and giving him the stock. Nobody in the 70s wanted to own stocks. It was a terrible period in terms of return, but it was a great period for Henry. So you look at Henry in the 60s, he's issuing shares furiously, and the 70s is buying back shares like crazy. If we do a comparison between Tim Cook and Henry Singleton, I know this is not a fair comparison because Tim didn't have the 1970s to work with, but Apple tripled its earnings in the last 10 years and Teledyne tripled its earnings in 12 years. It took a little longer than Apple. So we have one for Tim and zero for Henry in terms of the earnings growth. Apple bought back 39% of shares in 10 years and Teledyne bought back 90% of shares in 12 years. Henry trounces Tim Cook and Apple's up 6x in 10 years and Teledyne's up 40x. And so here you see earnings going up very similarly or the buyback period is also very similar in terms of it's 10 or 12 years, but you see a huge difference because the valuation deltas allowed Henry to buy back. And Henry was furious about the buybacks in the sense that he bought back well beyond the earnings of Teledyne. He took on debt to buy back the shares. And then later he retired all the debt. And so you see this 40X in 1985 and Henry knew Charlie and he approached Charlie and Warren. I don't know exactly when, but my guess is somewhere in the mid eighties, he approached them. And he wanted to, after this 40X, sell the entire thing to Berkshire. And Berkshire was interested in buying Teledyne with a bunch of very high quality businesses. They, he even had bought a bunch of insurance companies and whatever. But what Henry wanted, I told you he pays chess blindfolded with eight people and wins in all eight. He told Warren and Charlie that he wanted only Berkshire stock. He didn't want cash. So his final, I would say, brushes on the painting was to take the 40X. Then at that time, Berkshire shares were about $2,000 or $2,500 a share. And so it would have been about a 200X from then till now to his estate. And of course, Warren and Charlie balked at issuing Berkshire stock. And, and so that deal never took place. And, uh, but Henry still did fine. And the interesting thing about Henry Singleton is the people he had on his board. He had guys, Sarofim in Dallas, the Egyptian Finks. You can look him up on Google if you've not heard of him. He passed away recently. He had Arthur Rock, who was one of the first venture capitalists ever in Silicon Valley, funded Intel and whatever else. And he had Claude Shannon. And uh, Claude Shannon was a MIT professor and he was a mentor to Ed Thorpe. So he really had, these are just amazing individuals. So Henry himself was amazing, but he had some really good advi advisors around him. So just an interesting person to study. And there's a book that came out several years ago called Distant Force, which was written by Henry's number two guy, I think George Roberts. It's a great book to read if you're looking to learn more about Henry. And so again, furious pace of buybacks was key. Henry took on lots of debt that he paid back later and Henry bought back well above the end. He really recognized when he had an opportunity and he went for it. So 
the key factors, how fast the share has been retired, how quickly can we get to 80% gone? 80% shares gone means if the earnings are stable, you have a 5X. If there's no earnings growth and no multiple expansion. So you just get a 5X just based on shares being taken. And then you have to ask yourself, how much can earnings grow in this period? Earnings growth is key to multiplying that 5X. And then like Henry, can we buy back a lot of shares at low multiples and end up with high multiples and much higher earnings? And then we get to the promised land. And uh, so when you look at people like Henry Singleton and Warren Buffett, Buffett actually did not want to ever buy back shares. So he had a little different ethos from Henry. He did not, in his words, want to pay gin and rummy with his shareholders. So while Henry saw, thought of his shareholders as faceless people, Buffett thinks of his shareholders as partners. And so he doesn't want to really make money off his partners. He wants to make money with his partners. And that's why for the longest time, Berkshire resisted buying back shares. And I think only more recently, he's given a lot of, I would say, disclosures and, and is willing to buy back, but he wants to make sure the other side has all the information or nearly all the information that he does. So anyway, a little bit different ethos between Henry Singleton and Warren Buffett. Rare to have CEOs who know when to do buybacks. So this is a very rare skill. When to pause and when to issue shares. If you actually end up with a CEO who's a great operator, great capital allocator, and exceptional at knowing when to do the buybacks and when to issue shares, you're, you're like living in a utopian world. It's great. It's not great to be buying back shares at huge multiples. That just doesn't work very well. There is magic in buybacks and the magic really starts happening when you start taking out more than 80% of shares. So you buy back half the shares, you get a 2X if there's no change in anything else. You buy back two thirds, you get a 3X. You buy back 80%, you get a 5X. 90% is 10X and just keeps going. 99% is 100X. So the interesting thing is it really starts getting interesting after 80%. But what you also saw is to buy back 80% for most businesses can take two or three decades. And so you need a lot of stability in the business over a very long period of time. And you need to have a view that the business is going to be stable over that period of time. And then I didn't want to leave you hanging without any value addition with all this mumbo jumbo. So I got you a list that you can look at and you can go shopping based on this list. These are all the companies that have the highest 10-year buybacks ordered by how much they bought back in the last 10 years. And we've got 167 companies that have bought back more than 30% of shares in the last 10 years. And you have all kinds of companies over here you can look at that have done that. Then we also have another list of companies that have done a lot of buybacks in the last five years. And again, it's another list you can look at and see which ones of these. What I would do if I were looking at this list is I would look at the ones that I have some way of knowing that the business is going to be stable 20 years from now. And probably the business is going to be bigger 20 years from now. So Union Pacific is in there and uh, there's a good chance that railroad is cranking. 20 years from now as well. H&R Block is probably going to be cranking 20 years from now and, uh, and so on. So another list you can, uh, you can take a look at. And that's pretty much it. We'll basically go to going over what you have on your mind. Thank you. That was great, Monash. Thank you. So with that, I'll invite the students to ask any questions that they'd like. So please don't be shy. Just use the raise hand tool and I'll call upon you. Josh. Hi, Monish. Thank you so much for uh, speaking with us this evening. So my question for you is, you seem to favor stocks that pay a, a dividend. So is there any, is there ever any instances where it makes sense to buy a stock that does not have a dividend, but has, the, but has a greater chance for a higher return? I actually don't favor stocks that issue dividends. I'm not sure where you reached that conclusion. I've never paid much attention to the dividend when I'm looking at making an investment. A dividend actually, first of all, is a little bit suboptimal in the sense that you've got two layers of taxation going on. So one of the things which we didn't talk about in the buybacks is that they're returning capital to shareholders 
without Uncle Sam taking his piece. And uh, so there is some, a little bit of efficiency that you get in those buybacks. But yeah, I don't, I think that if a company is not able to invest in its own business at high returns on, at a high rate of return, and they don't understand or they not, don't have appreciation for buybacks, then yeah, then they should dividend it out. Of course, because that's the only choice left rather than letting it sit on the balance sheet and on, on nothing and so on. But yeah, I would prefer that companies that have really stable and good businesses and that they're going to be stable and good for a very long period of time, that after they're done in investing in their business, that they look at the buybacks. I, I would prefer that over the dividend. Monish, talk. can you talk a little bit more about that? It's interesting because a business... There's inherently that tension between continued growth for a good business and then buying back the stock. So it may not be an intelligent thing to do for a business that's particularly early in its runway, but maybe more of a mature business. It may be of some intelligence, depending on the price of the stock and the moment in time. It, the businesses that you're pointing to tend to be more mature when they're buying back stock and generating good returns. How do you think about that? I think a business should always give priority to its internal needs mm -hmm. and its internal growth needs. And the important thing is, which a lot of managers and CEOs don't think a lot about, is what is the return they're likely to generate from that additional capital going into the business. If they've got a great mousetrap and that great mousetrap delivers very high returns, in equity, it's a no-brainer. So you, put, yeah. you put your money there. But if your reinvestment opportunity is going to give you 8% return or something, then you need to evaluate whether a dividend makes, if the stock is at a very high multiple, then maybe a dividend is a better way to go than a buyback. And so, so I think if you're looking at those three options, dividend, buyback, or internal investment, and this is where most CEOs are useless because they usually get promoted. The number one reason they get promoted is they're exceptional salespeople or exceptional marketing people. They're able to build a lot of relationships and so on. And they don't, the capital allocation aspect of their skill set is never really tested mm. until they're in the top job. So if someone ran R&D at Intel, they never allocated capital. You know, mm. they just did R&D of their end marketing. Again, they never so then when they actually get the top job, that added piece. And I think that way, Tim Cook has been a really good CEO because he felt like he didn't understand these things well. And then he asked himself, who are the best people who can help me learn these things? And he reached out to Buffett. And he reached out to Buffett to specifically understand how he should think about allocating capital and buybacks and dividends. And I think Buffett gave him some good pointers. And then he's followed that playbook. And I'm sure they talk probably a few times a year. And I'm sure Tim just tries to keep improving his skill set on that front in terms of how he thinks about it. So Apple's a good example in the sense that they do need to invest in their business and they should and they are, but they also generate a lot of cash. And they could do the buybacks, they could do the dividends, or they could invest in the business, or they could do acquisitions. And how you sift through all that is important. Yeah. Other questions? Caleb. Yeah, Joe, please. Thank you for being with us tonight. Now, moving forward, do you think that your, your investment strategy is going to change with higher interest rates, more ge geopolitical situations? Are you, are you aiming towards to, to a different industry or how are you thinking about that? Yeah, when I first started investing in the mid-90s, interest rates were higher and of course, until they just kept falling until very recently. And they went really I internally always assumed that the, the long-term interest rate I always assumed is somewhere between seven to 9%. I just used to assume that. But actually the way I invest is because I'm looking for so much dislocation, those are Mickey Mouse factors. So if I, I think that, I think the investment case for me, it doesn't rest on whether the interest rate is 4% or 7%. I think that type of a delta should have no impact. So even between 2% and 7%, it wouldn't have much impact on the way I think about things. For example, we, and I was not able to convince this company to do buybacks. If they ever went down that path, it would be quite incredible. But I, I found this company and 
Turkey Resas, which basically runs, they're the number one owner of warehouses in Turkey, which they rent out to blue chip companies like Mercedes and Ikea and Carrefour and Amazon and so on. 12 million square feet, 99% leased, inflation indexed, very stable, very stable recurring revenues. In 2019, when we made the investment, the market cap was 20 million and the liquidation value was like 800 million. It was trading at two and a half time, two and two and a half percent of liquidation. Value. Crazy. I thought it was a fraud when I first heard those numbers. Now I think the market cap is north of 150 million. So it's moved up, even though the lira has collapsed and such and continues to collapse. The interest rates in that particular case are completely meaningless. Are they borrowing at 2% or 7% or whatever? You just have such a huge gap. So I think it just, I think that I also own a airport operator that's based in Turkey, but they operate 15 airports in eight different countries. And in that case, the market cap was under a billion. Probably their earnings in a few years will be two or 300 million. And airports are really good business. And they usually trade at very high multiples because they're such amazing businesses. And so again, in that case, thing is, the, if I'm correct about their trajectory of earnings, the interest rates really become irrelevant. So what we're looking for, we're looking for some very wide, wide gaps between price and intrinsic value. And when you have a wide enough gap between price and intrinsic value, you can have a wide range of interest rates that would all lead to a great result. Some may lead to a better result, but they'll all lead to a great result. As long as your thinking about the business is correct. So that's how I think about it. Caleb. Hi, is my mic working this time? Yes. All right, sorry. I couldn't figure out why it wasn't working last time. First, thank you for speaking as others have said. Your Dr. Shana Foundation it aims to give back to society through alleviating poverty, through promoting education. So what do you find is the biggest challenge in mobilizing that capital into getting it to help with education from there? The, what do you think the biggest challenge for translating that education into actual economic growth and mobility is? Yeah, that's a good question. The rules, the rules for charity and philanthropy are a little bit different from the rules we use when we're making investments. One of the differences is that you go high risk, high return. And when we invest, we are trying to go low risk, high return. We are trying to minimize the downside while retaining substantial upside. But when we are looking at charitable endeavors, and it was really Buffett who helped me understand this. He, he said, you really need to swing for the fences. And it's perfectly fine if you swing for the fences and you completely miss. So if you think about, for example, the Gates Foundation, and their drive to find a malaria vaccine. Now, that is high risk, high return, right? No one's found a malaria vaccine so far. They've put a good amount of money behind it. It may or may not ever give a return. We don't know. But I think if you ask Warren about that particular one, he would say it's the right thing to do. Because the thing is that if they succeed, they have a huge trajectory change in improving human lives across the world. And so the issue we face in philanthropy, which is very different from the issues we face as capitalists, is when I'm a capitalist running a business, I get to choose what area I want to focus on. And I get to choose what areas I want to put capital into. And I will typically choose areas which have the greatest promise. So for example, someone might think about coming up with an app right? Some kind of app which has the possibility to go viral, doesn't cost much, gets millions of downloads, and then some kind of freemium model, and they end up building a business that's worth a lot. That type of endeavor is very low risk and has the potential of high returns. And when you're trying to build an app or something, you want to try to pick areas that have great promise. And if you build an app, it doesn't work. You go build another app, doesn't work, build a third app, and you keep going some point, something might work. When we go to philanthropy, here's your choices. Climate change, education, poverty, homelessness, drug abuse, healthcare, poverty. All these are, each single one of these is a very difficult nut to crack. Okay. If you just look at the homeless situation in Los Angeles, 
not an easy problem to crack. Okay. And in a capitalist society, no one would deal with that problem because they'd say, Hey, if you look at a, if you apply a capitalist lens, you would say, I'm going to fail. What do I do? The odds of failure is very high, but Buffett would say, try to come up with the best approach you can and go all in on it. If you fail, it's okay. But the upside is so much if you get some success that we should try. So when I, when I set up Dakshana, I knew I had to go high risk, high return. The second thing that you do in philanthropy, which is different from running an investment fund or allocating capital is you concentrate to an extreme. So in my fund, I might have 10 positions and typically when I make a bet, it's 10 percent In charity, what you really ought to do is you should try to have only one bet. And the one bet should be, should absorb all your research go all in. The one thing that would deliver the biggest bang for the buck and is likely to move the needle is what you want to focus on. So what I did in Dakshana is I knew that we had to go all in on a single cause. The single cause is relatively easy if you can measure between different endeavors. So the second thing that we did is most charitable endeavors do not lend themselves to measurement. So for example, if you were to say, is it higher ROE or social return equity to, cap, to, to humanity to take care of the homeless population in LA, or is it better to reduce the effects of climate change? These are very hard questions to answer. It's really hard to get the, the data which would point you in the right direction. So what I did is I inverted the problem, which is like Munger says, invert always invert. I only looked at causes where measurement was easy. So if you have a homeless population and you give out needles to everyone, that's a really good thing to do. What is the impact of that versus taking some people off the street into temporary housing, which is better? I have no idea which is better. I don't know how to measure between those two, those two endeavors. It becomes really hard. So I'm not interested in going down paths where I can't measure outcomes. So... I wanted to measure outcomes. I had a bias towards education. Education generally gives you more measurable outcomes. And we ended up with a situation where we are able to identify really poor kids in India who are really bright. And we're able to, spending two or $3,000 per kid, do some pretty extreme changes to their, them and their families' future well being. And so these are, kids who are coming from families that are making 30 to hundred dollars a month, well below the poverty line and so on. And uh, we have some of these alums at Google making over half a million a year now. And uh, sometimes they used to go hungry at night, didn't have even boiled rice to eat. So you go from not having boiled rice to eat to making 50,000 a month at Google. That's great trajectory change. And uh, so that's how I thought about it. And uh, unfortunately, most charities don't think like this. They think about what feels good. They think about what pictures will look good. They think about how they can raise a lot of money and they don't even care about how efficient or inefficient their fundraising is. So in some cases, 90% of the money they raise goes into the process of raising the money. And they still feel that's great because they end up with 10%. Thank you so much, Manish, for sharing. So my question is about your time allocation. I'm curious about how much percent of your time you spend on people and how much percent of your time you spend on business, learning industry knowledge, and try to analyze. And I also learned that you have owned two companies previously. You used to be an entrepreneur in, in technology. So how this allocation of time evolve along your journey? Yeah, that's a great question. I went through in 1999, which is like, what, 23 years ago, I had these two in industrial psychologists who did a complete like 360 on me. They had me take a bunch of tests and they talked to people close to me, like my wife and family and friends and employees. And, and at the end of all of that, they gave me what I think of as my owner's man. They basically told me who I was. And each one of us is different. And at that time, I was running a business with 170 people. And I actually hated to go to work. I loved that business when it was just me alone in my bedroom trying to build it. 
And it was really a lot of fun till it got past 20 or 30 people. And then it just kept growing and my job turned into herding cats and HR and whatever. So they told me actually they couldn't even understand how I'm even able to function because that's so far away from who I am. And they actually explained to me who I am. And so between our genetics and what happens in the first five or six years of our lives, who we are is hard coded. It's not going to change after the age of six. So if you look at someone at the age of six and you see them at 96, they're going to look the same traits. Their behaviors might be different, but the traits are the same. So the traits are not going to change. So what they told me is that I'm a guy who likes to play games, but I don't like to play any kind of games. I like to play very specific kind of games. I like to play single player games. So for example, they said, I'm not the kind of guy who likes to be on a soccer team where the outcome depends on the whole team and the other team. So they said, I like to play games which are more, it would be more like singles tennis than soccer, okay? But they also said there were two more quirks in my personality. I like to play games where I think I can win. So I've got something which is telling me with my wiring, hey, I think this will be an easy game for me to play and win. So single player games that I can win and games that need no people. And in 99, when I went through this testing, I was thinking of, I was just about to start Pabrai Funds. And I was explaining to them that, look, I'm starting this new fund and it's only going to be me and so on and so forth. And they, so they encouraged me to leave my business as soon as possible. I actually started a CEO search and six months later, I left that company, which was great. It felt really good. And then a few months after that, someone offered to buy it and we moved on. When they looked at what Pabrai Funds was going to be, they said, this is perfect. This will work really well for you. And one of them then says to me, they weren't wealthy people, these two psych psychologists or psychiatrists. They said, I want to invest in your fund. So I said, look, man, I'm giving you like $1,000 to do all of this. And then you're going to give me $100,000 to go into the fund. I really don't want to lose money for you and all that. He said, crack your head open. I'm not going to lose any money. And uh, so he actually was one of the first investors in Pabrai funds and he did quite well. So he knew what he was doing. And, uh, and so now it's been 23 years and I still love it because there's no humans. So when you say spending time with people, I want to spend no time with no people except Arvind. Once in a while, I like to talk to Arvind and his uh, students. COVID actually gave me some experience working from home where there are very few humans. And uh, so I actually switched recently to 100% working from home because it becomes completely single player. And uh, I don't, I have a, so the Dakshina Foundation has a lot of people, but it's in India. Most of the operations are in India. I don't really run it. I've got a team that runs it. And I try to, their biggest complaint to me is that they hardly hear from me. And I said, it runs better because you don't hear from me. And I actually don't, I know that. I will be unhappy if I am deeply involved in the operations of Dakshina because that is not a single player game. And I was, I actually didn't even want to have a foundation. I actually wanted to write someone checks, but then I couldn't find people who understood what to do with those checks properly. So I was forced to do the foundation, but I tried to set it up in a manner where there's, it's ring fenced and that. So whenever I go to India, for example, and I'm, I basically spend all the time with the scholars and their families, the students we have. I spend no time with the management team and all the people and all that. And they complain, hey, you didn't come into the office. I said, exactly. I don't want to come into the office and have meetings and so on. <laughs> and so that's, that's how I proceed. And if there are less people around, I like to play bridge single player game. It's a player with game with a partner. So two players, it's okay. It works. And uh, investing works. That's not a team sport. And, uh, and so these types of things work really well. And I think everyone should get their owner's manual so they know how to go through life. Thank you so much, Manish, for spending your time with us. It's a lot of fun once a year. Man, when looking at a new CEO, what is the appropriate time frame to judge if they're good at allocating capital? 
Yeah, that's a hard question. I think that in an ideal situation, we would have a long history to look at. Sometimes we can get that long history and sometimes we can't. So if you can get that, you can look at someone and look at a long history of what they've done. It's one of the dilemmas I actually am looking at right now. I'm looking at this business where the CEO looks good, but it's his first job as CEO. And so he's been like kind of CEO for three years. And before that, he's been COO and, you know, VP and so on. So I don't have enough tread marks. I'm trying to figure out who this person is. I don't know. I mean, there's an unknown there and I can't tell. So it's a problem and it's not easy to get there. But if you can look at long histories, I made an investment in 2012 in Fiat Chrysler and Sergio Marchioni was the leader at the time. There were some Harvard case studies on him. He had run some previous businesses. There were a lot of trademarks. Even there was a book written about him and so on. So I had a lot of history then, which gave me a lot of comfort. But yeah, that's a great question. Try to ex extract whatever you can about their past. And sometimes we can get that and sometimes we can. Trevor. Yeah, thanks, Monish. I was wondering the notion of intrinsic value and where that factors in to your decision-making process. If you could contextualize that for me really in the class it, it within the context of an emerging technology or a startup, it seems like from a long time horizon view, this becomes a more significant challenge. I'm just interested like really to understand that definition of intrinsic or what are you really looking at there when you factor that in? Yeah, that's a great question. So. The definition of intrinsic value is really simple. It's the sum of cash that can be pulled out of a given business between now and judgment, counted by some reasonable interest rate. Okay. Now, calculating that is almost impossible for almost any business you can think of. There's a very small sliver of businesses where you could actually get some kind of handle around what that cash generation is going to be over that period of time. I was actually misled. And I think, I think Ben Graham, because he came out of this shell shock of the, the Great Depression and the huge collapse in prices in the 1930s, he anchored very heavily on intrinsic value. And he didn't even anchor on intrinsic value. He anchored on a, sub, a subset of book value. And so basically he was, his perspective was that a business should not be beyond what you might get in a liquidation for that business. And that's actually, in my opinion, the wrong way to think about it. So the ideal situation. So if we look at, let's say we look at a business like Amazon. So Amazon through its history, hardly generated any cash. Look at their annual earnings for a long period. They were almost non-existent. And the reason they were non-existent is because they were investing so heavily into the future of the business. And they never really clearly disclosed even from, I think that they've, they've never ever disclosed what that reinvestment rate is. So we cannot look at the financials of Amazon and come up with a number saying X amount has been spent on growth or X amount has been spent, which could have been distributed or have other uses. So they don't break that out. And uh, even if Amazon broke that number up, so even if Amazon told us, look, the business had a hundred billion in sales and seven billion in net income, and we plowed five of it or six of it back into the business, even if they gave us that, that still wouldn't help us because what matters is not the number that they're reinvesting, but what is the outcome of that reinvestment? And so with Amazon, we've got two problems. We don't know the number that they're reinvesting, and we don't know what the trajectory of that reinvestment. The correct way to think about a business like Amazon is to not even think about intrinsic value, is to basically say, okay, I know that they keep throwing things against the wall. I know that a lot of things they throw against the wall don't work. But the way Jeff Bezos used to do that is that the bet sizes were small when they threw stuff against the wall. So if things didn't work, they could write it off and move on. But there was so much asymmetry when things worked that when things did work, they got a massive exponential return 
versus what they put in, and then they could keep investing more and more. So this is an example of that. Put a little bit in, they saw it's working, they put a little bit more in. So we really cannot look at AWS from the point of view of how much capital went into it to build AWS. That really has nothing to do with the value of AWS. The value of AWS is what happened to them, right? you know, what the multiplier effect that they got. So when we look at a business like Amazon, and if I were an investor in Amazon, the only question I would ask myself is, is the business getting better? Is the business better today than it was a year ago, two years ago, or five years ago? And is the valuation within some reasonable range of possibly giving me a good outcome long-term? So when I look at a business like Amazon today and I look at their market cap and whatever, I don't consider it egregious. I don't consider the, the valuation egregious based on the different pieces that are there. And so the way I would look at Amazon is it's buy and hold for it. Okay. And the time to rethink Amazon is not based on valuation unless it goes really crazy. Amazon value goes to 10 trillion or 20 trillion or something and all bets are off tomorrow. It could go there over time. That might be okay. But the question is, one is if the valuation goes extreme or the second is the business is in decline. So you reach a conclusion that the business is worse than it was yesterday or the day or the five years ago. So if the business is in decline or the valuation is very extreme, those would be the two conditions under which, under which if I was an owner of Amazon, I would look to sell it. But I would not try to waste a lot of brain cells trying to figure out what the intrinsic value of Amazon is. Michael, so going back to Quinlan's question, so obviously prior to running Preparate Funds, you founded and ran a successful business. I'm just curious on how much of that experience do you think has contributed to your success in investing? And if so, like, what do you think were the most important like traits or performance attributes that you gained from that experience that was vital to running your firm? Yeah, so Buffett has a quote. He says, I'm a better businessman because I'm an investor. And I'm a better investor because I'm a businessman. There's a lot of cross-pollination that takes place between running a business and running a portfolio. And he also says that you can talk to a fish for a thousand years about what it is like to walk on land, but half an hour of actually walking on land would teach the fish a lot more than the thousand years of talking about it, if the fish could survive on land. So what I'm saying is that I, to some, in some way, they can't really answer your question because I ran a business, met payroll, did all these things. Then I became an investor. I actually don't even know how people can be investors without ever having run a business. I find that really difficult to fathom because to some extent, it's not real for them. They're looking at things through spreadsheets and things. And so when we look at a business and we just talked about Amazon, so let's continue with Amazon. Jassy, who's running it, or Bezos, who was running it, probably had three or four variables in their head that drove 80% of the outcome. And they don't didn't and don't run the business through spreadsheets. I think it, at Amazon, he doesn't even want to see, want to, even want to see PowerPoint. Right? He makes people write these essays on what they want to get funded and so on. So the thing is that the three or four variables that they are looking at is you look at if they're thinking of entering some new business or making some experiment, they look at the economics of that if it works and they'll see what the bet size should be. So if it doesn't work, it doesn't sink the company. And they look at what kind of people and team they can put behind it. So it gives it the highest chance of success. And then they nurture it and see if they can make it work. They are continuously doing that in a wide range of endeavors. And they're going even outside their industry classification. This has nothing to do with selling books. So they, their landscape that they're willing to look at is pretty wide. So I think that as an investor, you would need to have the same variables you're looking at that Bezos and his successor are looking at. And if you can get to the same variables that the CEO and his team are looking at when they're running the business, then you've nailed it. Then you've got the right framework. And getting to those same variables may not be that easy if you haven't run a business before. 
it's still hard even if you run a business today because the business may be very different than the one you ran. But you at least need to get into the mindset that is aligned with the way they think. And then you can go from there. Gavin. Hi, Munish. I just want to go back to the topic of effective share repurchasing strategy and smart capital allocation. I'm curious about what, in your opinion, is typically the biggest factors that contribute to a CEO or capital allocator having ineffective or value destructive share repurchasing over the long term. Because something I'm struggling to reconcile is that conceptually, the idea of buying shares when you believe that there are no organic investment opportunities that offer a higher return and or the shares are, are are way too undervalued conceptually it's not rocket science it's intuitive and it makes sense and yet we see as you mentioned that many very smart people very educated professionals have not a very great track record of employing it and i think a popular characterization or factor that people like to label to explain this is, is discipline they, it's a popular term undisciplined repurchases or undisciplined capital allocation because they come into a lot of money and they want to boost EPS in the short term or something of that sort. But I'm not exactly sure that encapsulates everything. And I'm saying this with several particular examples in mind, which is Curate and Liberty Global. According to their background, one would think, given John Malone's legendary status as capital allocator, that these would have been candidates that have be among the best being at buying back shares. And yet we've seen arguably that both companies have engaged in value destructive share buybacks in the recent years. So what are the biggest factors that makes what seems like a rather simple concept actually so incredibly difficult to execute well over long term? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So every single business on the planet eventually will cease to exist, okay? So it is in the nature of capitalism that we will see creative destruction. And we've seen that in the past. So how many companies are 200 years old? How many companies are 500 years old? How many of the companies around today will be around 100 years from now? Or 200 years from now? Or 50 years from now? 20 years from now? So the basic tenant of capitalism is that almost everything is going to be completed again. Once in a while, in an unpredictable manner for the most part, we end up with some moats. Like we end up with a moat around Coca-Cola or we end up with a moat around Visa or MasterCard or we end up with some moats around Louis Vuitton and so on. The people who founded these businesses could not see these moats, okay? They did not start these businesses saying, I'm going to build the biggest soft drinks company in the world. I'm going to control payments in the world. You go and study the history of these businesses. They're all accidents, accidental set of circumstances that leads. If you look at something like Amex today and the trajectory it's been through, it'd be very unpredictable that this is where it would be. And so basically, I think the reason all of this is difficult. So on one hand, we have this situation where almost everything in capitalism is going to disappear. Most businesses will disappear. On the other hand, you have CEOs and managers who have to have a trait if they're going to lead. The common trait they have is they're optimists. If they weren't optimists, they couldn't be leaders. So they have to be seeing a half full glass as overflowing. If they didn't see the half full glass as overflowing, how are they going to lead their troops and people? And so the, I, think this, I think it is par for the course that a CEO, typical CEO, may not have a good view on what his business, his or her business looks like 10 or 20 years from now. Because, you know, they're optimists. They think all their endeavors are going to work. They don't see the disruptive innovations coming from left field, all these different things going on. They don't see that. There's a parking lot near LAX, which I used to like a lot when I used to travel in and out of LAX called Wally Park. And every time I parked at Wally Park, I really liked everything about it. So Wally Park had these kind of leather, these hanging leather 
separators for each parking spot. So your car could never get dinged by another car. There was a because they separate. And they put that in the whole parking lot. So I said, wow, this is really nice. I come to Wally Park. And then they ran their shuttles very frequently and all of these things. Okay. And I used to always think I should go tell the owner of Wally Park that if he ever decides to sell the business or something, give me a call. Berkshire style, write him a letter or something. I just love the business. And it was very popular relative to the other parking spaces and other parking operators. And no one else had copied that leather thing, even though they could all see it. Then suddenly Uber comes along. Okay. And I'm not driving to the airport. Okay. And suddenly I look at Wally Park and they got too many spaces. That business suddenly changed. So the, the thing is that I was looking at that business. I love that business. I couldn't see anything that would take away parking from being a great business for 50 years around LA. But it, even that business got disrupted. So I think that this creative destruction of capitalism is really a powerful force. It's not linear. It comes from left field. It comes suddenly. You see something coming up and Clay Christensen wrote about it with the innovator's dilemma and all of that. So I don't blame the managers always so much. I think the managers, maybe they have too much on their plate. They're trying to run the ship. They're trying to motivate their troops. They're trying to meet payroll, all these things. And for them to have a view of what happens 20 years from now, that's really hard. And even when in Berkshire Hathaway, so many of the businesses they bought have disappeared. So many of the businesses they bought were mistakes to buy. Probably half the businesses they bought are either mistakes or have disappeared. And so the forces are very powerful. And when we look at I haven't followed Liberty and Malone in a long time. He's a smart guy. He always takes care of himself. I always found the, some of the ways things happened, not quite Buffett-esque in the sense that Buffett doesn't want to play gin and rummy with his shareholders, but Malone doesn't seem to have too many issues with that. And so anyway, I don't have much of a view on what's been going on there. But I would just say that when I look at this whole area of the cannibals and all of that, I can't rely on the manager. What I have to really look at is, I have to look at businesses which look like Union Pacific Railroad. I think 20 years from now, Union Pacific is around. Now we'll see if it becomes like Wally Park and something comes along, who knows? But I think there's a good chance those rights of ways and all of that stuff that it's around. But there's very few businesses like that. And especially when you go long enough time horizon. And especially if you're looking at cannibals, we need to go really long time horizon to get hundred X, 300 X. The good news is that if you had a portfolio of 10, you could have seven that don't work and still, will still be a great return. So some of this can be taken care of with bet sizing and so on. Thank you. That was very insightful. Sure. I believe you once said, if you were spending a lot of time analyzing a business in Excel, then something is seriously wrong. So with that in mind, could you Walk us through what mental models you find most useful today and how those have perhaps changed over the course of your career. Yeah, actually what I said is that if you open Excel, there's a problem. Spend time on it, just even open Excel. If you're looking at a business and you can't do the math in your head, then I think there's a problem. The mental models, I think the first thing that goes through is you've got to really be honest about circle of competence. Look at a business and you say, okay, there's something... I understand or I don't. The entire, I don't understand anything about biotech. I don't want to deal with the defense sector because it deals with one customer, a few customers. I don't like that. I don't like the healthcare industry in the U.S. because it has non-market forces working on it. So there's entire areas that I just don't understand. And anytime I encounter, and if I encounter anything with blockchain, that's way above my pay grade. So it's gone. So a lot of things just go away. And I think the important thing is, like Buffett says, the size of the circle is not important. Staying in the center is very important. So the first question is a circle of competence. Then when you feel that something is within your circle of competence, then, you know, by definition, we should be able to figure out what its likely trajectory is going to be. And then you look at the, you would also be able to figure out what kind of low return on equity, high return on equity, needs a lot of capital, doesn't need a lot of capital, what kind of person's running it, what kind of capital allocator do we have, all these different things are going on to figure out whether you want to spend time to. Yeah, thank you. 
Tim. Bonish, thank you for speaking with us today. That Excel comment, no, that's one of your commandments. A few others that I find interesting there are thou shall not short and thou shall not introduce leverage. And I find those two interesting because those are two techniques or two strategies. Investors, you'll see it more on the institutional side instead of retail, individual retail. But those are two strategies that people can use to hedge positions or reduce risk. And earlier in this discussion, you talked about how the lira in Turkey has plummeted over the past year. So with all that in mind, how can an individual retail investor reduce risk with their investments? Is that something we should be thinking about or should we really just be focusing on finding that intrinsic value with these companies? Yeah, I think that I would stick by those commandments. Shorting is a dumb exercise in my opinion, basically. You, you make a double if you're right and you go bankrupt if you're wrong. And my friend Bill Ackman recently said he's done with shorting. So it's nice to see he finally grew up which is great. And uh, yeah, I think, and even leverage, I think, like I said, to finish first, you have to first finish. And uh, equity prices in an auction-driven market can do anything. And uh, so if you're levered, then you do not get to play out. You're out of the game. So we don't really want to go down those paths. I think that investors should think of themselves similar terms to the way I would say that the Walton family thinks about it. Sam Walton had distributed the stock to his gene pool and then he passed away and then there were Waltons who were no longer running the place. And all of them for the most part have kept their shares for several decades after that. And he made up over 90% plus of their assets unhedged. I'm pretty sure none of them had any puts on Walmart. Sam Walton would be turning in his grave if someone, his son or daughter bought puts on Walmart or something. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think that the thing is you carefully selected a dozen businesses or so, or 10 businesses or something, and you've gone long and you have no leverage. And uh, even half of them may not work because of the nature of capitalism. The result can still be very good. Ben. Hey, Monish, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with our class. You're a complete legend to me. Later on in life, when I have to make important decisions, you're one of the very few people that I'm going to refer back to help me make that decision. And when I'm going to be making these decisions, thinking back to your advice, I'm going to be trying not to make a mistake. And that leads me to think about two things, how 90% of active managers can't beat the market and also how Buffett says he knows within one, two, three, whatever, five minutes looking at a company, whether he wants to spend another 20 minutes looking at it. So why is it that you think 90%, what's the biggest mistake or the most common mistake that 90% of active managers are making that's preventing them from being able to beat the market? And also, what are the most important filters that you use, whether they're industry filters or like valuation financial filters, when you're looking at a company where you say, nope, not, I'm not looking at this anymore? I think the reason most managers cannot beat the index is really for two reasons. One is the index doesn't have frictional costs. and the manager does, so the manager might have one, two, three percent of frictional costs every year, including all the trading costs and all of that. And so they have to overcome that hurdle, which is a significant hurdle to overcome. And the second is that when we look at the stock market, something like 4% of stocks deliver almost all of the returns. So there's some studies about how s and has done like 9% a year for 100 years, but if you took away the top 4% performers, you'd be left with nothing. And like more than half the stocks deliver negative returns long-term. So basically, and again, that goes back to the creative destruction and all of that. So the thing is the index is too dumb to know that it owns Amazon and it owns Apple, and it owns Alphabet, owns Microsoft and owns all these companies. And it's also too dumb to ever sell these companies. And so it owns these companies. It never sells these companies. These companies keep becoming a larger and larger portion of the index. It doesn't really rebalance and such. It just sits there. Whereas the active manager, even when they're smart enough to buy Amazon, they're trying to figure out every day, should they sell it or keep it? They get in their own way. 
So how many people figured out Amazon and then kept it for 10 years? So there's a fund manager in Scotland, Bally Gifford. And I like the Bally Gifford people a lot, even though I think they're overdosed on Carvana right now. But, but Bally Gifford, when they go in, they'll just be there. Right? It's, it, they try to find these great businesses and they try to they'll hang on for a long time. Berkshire does that and so on. So I think the active manager, the deck is stacked against them, right? You got the frictional call and you basically are going to be picking one out of 25. Out of every 25 stocks, one is the winner and 24 aren't so great, which is why the, you get even a 50% error rate. And so figuring out what these companies will do long-term in the light of the creative destruction that capitalism imposes on you, it's a difficult thing to do. Troy. Hey, Monish, thanks for taking the time again this year to speak with the class. I had a question around your thoughts or your evolving thoughts on investing in China and companies in China. Obviously, when we spoke last year as a class, you had some glowing thoughts on Tencent and Alibaba, and you've made investments there in the past. And I think earlier you made a note of how things have changed over the past couple of weeks. Obviously not. It's been an evolving change. So I just wanted to get your perspective on investing in China and how that's evolved over time. Yeah, I think probably for me, China would always be difficult. I think in the past, like, one time I invested in Mao, which was a stock Lilu told me about. Alibaba and Tencent, very well-run companies, great governance and all of that. But we've got the unknown of the government and all their policies and all of that. And maybe they can transcend and maybe they cannot. I don't know. So I think given the leadership in China and given how they think about things, I would just not put a lot of energy behind China at this time. I still like Tencent a lot as a business. I think Pony Ma is a once in a generation manager and he may find a way to transcend all the headwinds and curveballs that keep throwing at him. We'll have to see. Just one quick follow-up on that. Are there any lessons outside of China and how you think about geopolitical risks? Obviously you have investments. You mentioned Turkey, obviously you have investments in India. Are there, are, is it really just in the context of China or are there other things, other areas that you've evolved your thinking on? I think I should put all my energy behind a place like Turkey. I think I should spend a lot more time. The, in, the investors that I would be buying stock from in Turkey. So the Turkish stock market, is mostly held either by insiders or foreigners. 80% is held that way, and that doesn't trade. The other 20%, which is held by the locals, et cetera, turns over every nine days. And for most locals, nine days is too much. They want to invest at 10 and be done at two, four-hour holding period. And Buffett says that stock market is a mechanism to transfer wealth from the active to the inactive. And couldn't be. And these gamblers, they're not investors speculators or gamblers sold me resas at two and a half percent of liquidation value because they couldn't be bothered what the companies do. That's not part of the equation at all. When you're buying at 10 o'clock and selling at two o'clock, you are not running any intrinsic value calculations. You're just trying to have some kind of psychology that somebody will pay you something more than what you paid or whatever. And uh, so I think that because of the, the nature of the investors and also that the geopolitical and all of that, everyone's exited. I still think like 95% or 97% of Turkey is not investable. But there's the 3 to 5% where their revenues are in euros or dollars. Inflation is a tailwind rather than a headwind. And people aren't interested because the baby got thrown out of the bathwater. So like we have a Coke bottler in Turkey. We've got a company that imports all the VW brands and controls most of those dealerships in Turkey. These are really good businesses. And the gamblers will give it to you at great prices. So that's where I think I should put more time and energy. Monish, the foreign ownership you just mentioned, why doesn't that trade? I'm just saying institutional investors are not going in and out every... They did go out, I think, in 2018, 2019, 2017. There was a mass exodus, yeah. right? So there were Templeton funds sold me races at two and a half percent of liquidation. I don't know what John Templeton thinks of that in his grave. Okay. <laughs> but they're supposed to have the framework 
But some guy in New York says exit and then they exit Turkey. So that sort of thing happens. And so, yeah, I think that the institutions in a place like Turkey, I think they have a somewhat longer horizon, but I think they get, they also get spooked out. I think at this point, everyone and their brother has left. So, the, but the thing is that the stock market's kind of like a theater, right? Every seat has to be occupied. And so every share has to be held by someone. So if you are exiting, it's like a burning theater. You have to find somebody who will take your ticket and go back in and sit in the theater. And if the theater is on fire, that ticket is not going for a hundred dollars. You pay to get that seat. You'll take 10 cents. And you're enjoying the movie. So that's good. I think that I got to make sure I'm in the part of the theater, which is not going to get affected. The theater, the theater is on fire, but there's, <laughs> like, there's a balcony where it's not going to get there or something. Tim. Yeah. Thanks for being here, Monish. Your presentation and also the mention of Bailey Gifford seemed like an offshoot of your search you mentioned, I think last year of being yourself as or position your fund for much longer hold periods. I would just love to hear how that transition is going, like any update there and that. I remember you said that you were like pretty pregnant with positions, et cetera. Yeah, when I first started in 94, 95, I was buy and hold forever. That's how I thought about it. And then I did really well. I had 200 baggers in that period from 90 till 99, 2000. And then I probably saw the internet bubble maybe 12 weeks before anyone else. I was about 10, 12 weeks out of the crowd. Not a huge lead, but some lead. So I got really concerned that this thing would blow up because those valuations were really crazy. There was a lot of crazy behavior at that time. So I switched. I started for Bry Funds and I basically switched to a very heavy Ben Graham approach in 99, 2000. Basically where, you know, the day the NASDAQ I think March 9th, 2000, 5,000 or something, was the day Berkshire hit a multi-year low. So people were selling Berkshire and buying pets.com. That's what was happening. there. And so at that time, there were a lot of basic businesses, steel companies, funeral homes, and things of that nature that were single-digit multiples, were available really cheap and very stable businesses. So I switched to those businesses. And, and I did really well, basically completely sidestepped the NASDAQ crash and everything else. And uh, basically what I should have done is probably in 2012 or thereabouts, I should have switched back. I should have switched back to the great growing businesses. And what happened is that I became so comfortable with these cigar butts and I did so well with them eight or nine years with like 36% a year before fees or something. That, and even in 2009, when the market crashed, I put the entire fund almost completely in commodities that crashed, like you wouldn't believe. We were up like 130% in one year and so on. So those things came back really fast. So it worked, but what I should have done is in around 2012 or so, I should have switched back again to the great businesses, paid up for the businesses like I used to. And uh, it was really, I think, in 2020 when I read the uh, Nick and Zach chapter in, I read the manuscript that William Green had sent up, which I was happier, that I realized that I'd screwed up, that I had to go back, that the holy grail in investing is a small ownership of a great going business over a very long period of time. I think that's really where you get to utopia. You don't, I have this friend in Turkey. And he's basically everything I bought in Turkey. I only visited businesses in Turkey where he already owned it in his fund. So I told him, I only want to visit businesses that you already invested in. <laughs> okay. Because I needed cover. First layer is someone's already put money in. And he's a very smart investor and he's deeply overdosed on Ben Graham. And I'm trying to get him to dose more or at least dose up a little bit on Charlie Munger. So I actually sent him a, bust of Charlie Munger, told him to worship it every morning. But so the thing with him is he takes me to race us. He owns it in his portfolio. He tells me it's at two and a half percent of liquidation value. And race us goes from a 20 million market cap to a 40 million market cap. And he completely exits. So I asked him, I said, you told me it's worth 800 million. He said, Monish, I have a simple rule. Everything at hundred percent is sold. 
Once I make 100%, I sell it. So I told him to triple his manga worship time every day and to take the, like the incense sticks the Indians have and put it on manga. And he's doing that. He actually told me he goes to the Charlie Munger bus, but he says it'll take a long time to reprogram. So anyway, what I'm saying is that I think that the holy grail is the great going business. That's where we want to be. And so I was snow white and then I drifted and then I'm trying to get to be back to snow white again. Michael, I'm just wondering, how do you distinguish between whether or not a stock has diminished in price due to risk or just uncertainty? We're not going to always get it right. I think the thing is that like John Templeton said, you're going to be wrong at least one out of three times and probably more like half the time. So we use all the tools at our disposal to try to make sure that something is not in secular decline and something is a temporary hiccup. And uh, we may not always get it right. It's a difficult thing to get right. On. Gavin. While we're still close to the topic about Chinese stocks, I had a question regarding Tencent. I've listened to one of your talks in which you said that you thought it was maybe more attractive to get Tencent exposure through process than directly holding Tencent. And then in that conversation, the topic sort of just went on and you didn't really get a chance to elaborate that. So I was curious as to exactly why you thought it was better. There's a big, there's a big gap between the look-through value of Tencent through process and the process market cap. So you're seeing a, at times that gap was more than 40%. So it's hard to ignore that. And also process is aware of that gap and willing to take action to try to close that gap. The danger there is that what they've said is they're going to sell down some 10 cents and buy back process. And they're also selling down some 10 cents or taking some dividends and making other investments. So the question is that how does process, how well does process do on its non-Tencent investment? And is that kind of sell-off of Tencent to buy back process? I think that can work if you don't take the Tencent position down too much. So they used to have 29% if they go to the 20s or low 20s. Probably still okay if you're buying back at that huge discount. But yeah, I think the, a lot of investors prefer just owning Tencent directly. And that can be valid, but I think in my way of thinking, it's difficult to ignore that big gap and there are people who want to take action to close. Can I have a quick follow-up to that? Sure. So a lot of why investors might be, as you said, preferring to directly hold Tencent versus investing in holding company thesis that has underlying exposure is that there's some degree of frictional or managerial costs that you're going to have to be paying up in order to get that optionality of those managers and their decisions. How do you think about quantifying or weighing those sort of frictional costs and managerial costs in some cases, which may be unseen because of during times where quick decision making is rewarded, there is generally a sort of lag between you directly controlling your assets versus having another manager, in this case, own the company that you like. Yeah, I would say that let's look at it this way. If a person invested in Tencent directly, the reason they're investing is they believe that Tencent will be a lot more valuable in the future. Right? That's the only reason they would, you would buy Tencent stock is because you had a viewpoint that it's a business that's undervalued or likely to create a lot of value in the future. So let's say, for example, that over a five-year holding period or a 10-year holding period, 10 cent triples or quadruples in price, for example. And now we have this ownership in process. There's a discount. There's a holding company discount. There's some frictional costs and they may or may not invest their own other money as well as Tencent does and so on and so forth. But also that gap may close. It may be half the gap it was in 10 years. That's possible. So it's not apparent to me that in these two scenarios that holding Tencent directly 
would have the superior outcome. That's not apparent to me. I think the important thing that matters in both cases, the more important thing that happens is that Tencent value has to go. And if the Tencent value goes up and the stock directly with Tencent is a 4X and me holding it through process is a 3X, for example. Okay, so then in that case, that was not a, that was not an optimal decision, but I still got to get some of the upside from Tencent. It wasn't completely lost. So the important thing I think in this equation is that do you believe or not believe that Tencent will be a lot more valuable in the future or not? If it is a rising tide is going to lift all boats. So if it is more valuable, they'll both the, both the stocks will do fine. I think it's possible process could do better, possible, but it's also possible it does the same or it does worse. Got it. Josh. So I also wanted to ask you, so what are signals? So when, so when do you decide it's time to sell a stock? In other words, what are some signals that you take in when, to know that it's time? Bill Fisher says that if the job is done right, every sell decision is a mistake, right? So when I grow up, that's where I want to be. I haven't grown up yet. But so ideally, if you find yourself in the happy position of owning a great business and it's continuing to increase in value and it's not extreme in its valuation, you would just keep holding it. It wouldn't matter if you perceived as being above intrinsic value or anything like that, you just hold it. The second reason you would sell something or the reason you would sell something is you realize you made a mistake. You realize that the future prospects of a business are vastly inferior to what you'd originally thought. And the third reason could be opportunity cost. And that's actually a difficult one because the mistress always looks better than the wife. And in actuality, the wife might be pretty old. Susan. Yeah, I'm basically an individual investor and I'm a big fan of BRK, of course. But I just learned in all the readings from this class about Markle Corporation. And I was wondering what your views are, if any, of Markle. Yeah, Markel is a wonderful business. I think they've got some excellent insurance businesses because they are they used to be excess surplus lines in insurance, which is the odds and ends that most people didn't want to deal with. Generally, if you're good in those lines, the profit margins can be better. But I, I, if I were to choose between Markel and Berkshire, I would choose Berkshire. I think that the capital allocation prowess of Berkshire, Buffett and such is, is very proven over a very long period of time. Markel has started to make private investments in buying whole companies. I just don't have enough data there. I think that's a much more difficult area. Even Buffett's had a lot of difficulty in the whole acquisitions. I would say probably a good one third of the companies they bought have ended up being mistakes. But I don't know what that error rate is in Markel. To me, between the two, I would go with it, even though it's larger and size is a anchor. Thank you. But do you attend the Berkshire annual meeting? I haven't. And I'm thinking of it this year, especially given their ages. But Yeah. And every Sunday morning, there's a Markel brunch in Omaha. Yes. yes. And so you could attend that brunch. The food is good. And Tom Gaynor, who's a good friend, he's on stage. So you get buy one, get one free. Sounds good. Thank you. Mona, you've been so generous with your time. I thought we'd go, I thought we'd go for another two hours, Arvind. I think you're getting <laughs> sleepy or something. No, I'm not. I'm, I don't have the time advantage that you do in Austin. But, but it's better. It's not as strong as you once had in Orange County. So that's good. It's weakening. <laughs> but you've been so generous with your time. I'd ask to, love to ask you one final question, which I ask you every year. In this room, there are students that are graduating college to those graduating business school. Is, any, is there any advice that you would leave them with, either personally or professionally, as they launch into their journeys ahead? The I, yeah, there's a couple of things. One is I would encourage all of you to get your owner's manual. And I'll give Arvind the name of the guy who did it for me with his contact. If you want to pursue that or you can contact someone else. I have no kickback coming to me if you do that, just FYI. But I think it's important to know who you are. I think that's 
I think I wish we came with our owner's manual. So I didn't really know who I was till I was 35. And it would have been of some benefit to know at 20 or something. So that's one thing I would say is just try to understand who you are. And, and then the other thing that what Buffett says, which is you go to work for people you like, admire, and trust. And so it's not about the name brands. I think a lot of times when you're getting out of business schools, people focus on the brands. And it's really about the people you work with or the person you work under and, and all of that. So I think it's not about which place pays you the most or which sounds the most when you're at a dinner table at Thanksgiving with your family or something. I think it's really more along where the values align or Buffett says you get better if you hang out with people better than you. So you want to always make sure that you're in the company of very high quality people. And, and so that should be the criteria. Is go to work for places where you are moving up in the world from a quality point of view. What a wonderful note to end on, Monash. Thank you so much. And we'll talk soon. All right. Thank you, Arvind. Always a pleasure. Bye. Thank you.